witnesses in the courtroom. Anything for the state before we send for jurors? No. And for the defense? Not at this time, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to see you bright and early. Um, we are ready to resume the trial of the case. Call your next witness, please. All right, once you're comfortable, if you will, state your first and last name, and uh, let's spell that for our court reporter as well. My name is David Michael Branny. Uh, the last name is B-R-A-N-I. And uh, where are you employed, sir? I'm employed with Applied Technical Services in Marietta, Georgia. And that's in Cobb County? It is. How long have you been employed with uh, ATS, or Applied Technical Services? Uh, full time since about 2004. And uh, why don't you explain what ATS is? It's an independent test lab that has a variety of engineering services. One of them is non-destructive testing. I uh, do a lot of work in the paper mills and chemical plants. Another wing of it is material analysis, which is a part of the group I'm in. Uh, we also have calibration of instruments, dimensional analysis, and some other engineering services. Okay. Is one of the uh, things that ATS is um, capable of doing is doing some thermal testing? Certainly. We have. Uh, Technicians and engineers that do thermal testing, and then my, I myself do uh, this type of testing in support of industry and also in support of litigation matters. Why don't you uh, explain to the jury what sort of qualifications you have that uh, allows you to work with ATS and do thermal testing? Uh, part of my background, I've uh, received a four-year degree in engineering, mechanical engineering, <coughs> from the University of Florida. Later on, I attended Georgia Tech and received through a PhD. <coughs> My emphasis in graduate programs was the thermal sciences, which is thermodynamics, heat transfer, and fluid mechanics. Uh, many of the things that many of the things that I've done in this work um, I'm presenting today is related to the world of heat transfer, essentially, uh, somewhat also fluid mechanics. Uh, other areas of uh, background: I had taught for about 11 years at Southern Polytechnic State University in their mechanical engineering technology department and many of the same principles of engineering that apply to this I've applied in the classroom. Uh, and then also my work at ATS, I've had uh, numerous occasions to use the type of instrumentation I was using for the testing that day uh, in support of other, again, legal and non-legal matters over the years. And do you have a PhD as well? Yes, I do, a PhD can, from Georgia can, Tech. Can you explain um, what, what the PhD is in? Uh, it's in mechanical engineering. And again, as I said before, it's uh, when you're in a Ph.D. program, you can pick, pick special emphasis of courses to take, and the primary emphasis for myself was 
again, the thermal signs, it's fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and um, thermal dynamics. In, in layperson's terms, can you explain a little bit about thermal dynamics and, and uh, what, what, what that means, what we're talking about? Uh, <laughs> it's always difficult for me. Thermal dynamics, uh, as far as the relation to this, it's a little less. I think the primary subject would be heat transfer. Mm -hmm. But thermodynamics in general has to do with the behavior of fluids and other things as far as energy. So think of your home air conditioning system. Uh, thermodynamics relates to uh, helping a design engineer design a system for heating and cooling, uh, things like that. And what about heat transfer? How does that compare? Uh, heat transfer is part of thermodynamics in the sense that if you have a air conditioning refrigeration system, at some point you're transferring heat from the refrigerant system for instance, to the outdoors. That's that unit outside that when we hear it dies and the compressor breaks, we all have a bad moment. Uh, the heat transfer issue then is the fluid that holds the, uh, the coolant in the refrigeration system is trying to give up heat to the outside, and that's a heat transfer problem. And that's where the, the nature of heat transfer, if you will, kind of morphs into the world of thermodynamics. And are there uh, ways within your field of expertise that you can measure both thermal dynamics and heat transfer? Uh, a better question may be there's ways of taking measurements in both fields, and in both fields there's uh, overlap as to the type of measurements. For example, uh, in the world of thermodynamics slash heat transfer, uh, one of the things you may want to know is the flow of your speed of the air in the duct ducting system or the home air conditioning system. So you can take measurements to record that flow rate. <coughs> Obviously, another one is temperature. You may want to keep track of temperature within the duct system to see how well we're cooling the air. Uh, another would be pressure, for example, within the system. But there's a variety of techniques that are common to both. I want to focus on that middle one that you just talked about, temperature. Do you have devices at ATS that are capable of documenting temperature uh, at various locations? <coughs> yes, we do. Uh, a variety of instrumentation in this particular matter I chose to use thermal couples. In addition, I had a, a temperature humidifier recorder, which is a separate type of device for measuring outside temperature. And have you testified as an expert before uh, in thermal testing and in heat transfer science? I have, essentially, yes. Um, at this time, tendering Dr. Brain as an expert in thermal testing and heat transfer science. Can I have one here? Good morning, Dr. Brainy. Good morning. Is it Brainy or Brainy? I always say it rhymes with Granny. So okay, <laughs> Brainy. All right. Um, you said your your primary or the primary field that would apply in this case is uh, heat transfer. Is that correct? I think that's fair to say. Yes. Okay. And um, in your role as an engineer, a mechanical engineer at ATS. Have you ever studied uh, temperature rises in vehicles? Outside of this case, no. I did do some study in preparation for the testing I did for this case. But as far as temperature monitoring in a vehicle, uh, no, I've not done that. But you, you, you did do some studies in prepping for this case? Uh, I would say in prepping for the testing I did on site. In other words, prior to going on site, I just reviewed some general literature out there as to what other folks have done as far as testing went and some of their results. Okay. Prior to testing outside in this case? Yes. Okay. Um, is it fair to say that um, a lot of your role as far as an expert in a legal case um, is, has got to do with maybe safety compliance? Is that, is that accurate? No, I think okay. with my background, um, there's a variety of things that I get involved in the legal community. Uh, machine guard safety is one issue and safety in general, but that's just a component of what I do. Okay. Um, have you ever testified in a criminal case? No, I have not. Have you ever been uh, tendered as an expert in a case where um, you're being asked to measure the temperature inside a vehicle? 
Well, again, specific to vehicles, no. In general, with respect to reporting things like temperature and other items, yes, I have in the past. And in particular, from my world, from heat transfer and my background, it's not so much whether it's a vehicle or not. My main concern is the type of medium I'm measuring in. In this case, it's air in the range of temperature I'm in. For example, it's air in the order of 100 degrees Fahrenheit as opposed to maybe in a furnace. Uh, I've done work in both, but the key component for me in this case is I'm, I'm measuring temperature in air and the relative values I'm at, and I routinely do that in the past. Okay. Um, so you, your expertise isn't limited to heat transfer of objects, like for example, heat and how it heats <coughs> up a piece of metal on a, on a machine. No, it's not limited to that. Okay. You've got plenty of experience in testing air for the temperature in the air. Yes. Okay. Right. I don't have any objections. Mr. Testified. All right. You were called upon in this case by <coughs> Cobb Police and the District Attorney's Office to uh, perform a heat study at a specific location, that being the Home Depot treehouse. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, before we get to that, I want to tender states 386 uh, for the record. This is a certified copy, self-authenticating with a business record certification from Dobbins Air Force Base regarding the specific temperatures from June the 18th of 2014. So I tender states 386. We did that last week. You did. Okay. Ledger. Admitted. All right. Um, when is it that you specifically went to the Home Depot treehouse uh, location to do testing? It would be July 18, 2014. If this offense occurred... I'm, excuse me, Counsel. July 8, 2014. Right, July 8. If this offense occurred on or about uh, June the 18th of 2014, um, how much time would have elapsed? Are we less than three weeks away? I believe it's right at three weeks, plus or minus a day. Okay. And, uh, in fact, we looked at a calendar online just to confirm that it was uh, essentially... If, if the 18th was on a Wednesday, two yeah. weeks elapsed, and then on the Tuesday before, what it would have been a full three weeks is when you went out to do the testing. Right, that's correct. Okay. And um, I want to talk about the temperature on uh, July uh, the 8th of 2014 as compared to the temperature that's documented from Dobbins Air Force Base in States Exhibit 386. Um, first of all, describe for the jury what it is that you uh, planned on doing uh, going into the heat testing uh, from July the 8th of 2014. Mm -hmm. What equipment were you planning on using and what was the purpose? The primary purpose was to determine the temperature inside the vehicle throughout the day for the day of testing that I did. I did secondary measurements uh, just depending on whether I would make use of them at a later time. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, as far as temperature goes, we ended up using about 12 different thermocouples. I had them placed around the vehicle at various locations. Some were at floorboards, some were at the ceiling, uh, somewhere near the vicinity of the uh, child's care seat. And in addition to that, then, I had recorded secondary data. Uh, some of that data included uh, continuous monitoring of the humidity and temperature in the vicinity in a shaded area, uh, essentially getting the ambient or the outdoor temperature in addition, I uh, took measurements regarding wind speed. I had what's called a vane anemometer. Uh, it's a tool to attempt to measure wind speed, and I would record that every hour. Another measurement I was taking out there, uh, I was using what's called a light meter. And a light meter just gives you an idea of the intensity of the sun and kind of the visible portion of the light, how bright the sun is, essentially. And I was taking those readings uh, every hour during the day. Let's see. Another reading I took was not so much measurement, but I had a constant video recording showing the vehicle throughout the day. Part of the issue for uh, temperatures in the vehicle, of course, is going to be how much sunshine is falling on the car or partial shade, if you will. So I used a video recording throughout the day to uh, watch the car so that if someone was interested, in, in my case and myself as well later, to go back and uh, get a time lapse of how the sun was shining that day. That video was used for that purpose. Those were the primary things I was reporting on. And you just mentioned something that I want to touch on. This entire process throughout the day um, was, was captured and um, recorded both on, using a video recorder, but you also took some photographs as well, correct? Yes, and in fact, I, 
video I was using to capture the sunlight. I did take photographs in the sense that upon the hour, I would literally just look up and Bless you. write down what I thought the sky condition was at that instance. But during the day, especially in the earlier portion, the sky condition was changing quite a bit, uh, kind of in and out of sun, etc. So one of the things I would do um, at those uh, time frames is I would aim my camera to the sky and take photographs to, get, to capture qualitatively what the sky was doing. Now, uh, during this process, were there investigators with the Cobb County District Attorney's Office and uh, Cobb County Police present to uh, monitor what was going on? Yes, there were individuals from Cobb County out there with us that day. And were you allowed access uh, specifically to uh, a Hyundai Tucson um, with a car seat in it uh, so that you could put the thermal couples inside and measure the heat uh, rise in, inside of that vehicle? Yes, on a previous date, uh, I went to the Cobb County facility where I had access to the vehicle, and at that point we set up our various thermal couples within the vehicle. This is a few days prior to the testing itself. I'm going to show you a series of photographs, 381, 382, 383, 384. Are those fair and accurate depictions of the Tucson that you tested? at the Home Depot Treehouse location from July the 8th of 2014? Yes, they are. You had a chance yesterday to look at State's Exhibit 379. Yes. And looking at 379, which for the record is a thumb drive, does it have the digital photographs of what we just referred to as 381 through 80? 381 through 383 contained thereon. That's, that's my recollection, yes. Okay. And in addition to that, after completing your testing, did you prepare a graph that showed um, the heat, the temperatures from the monitors, the sensors on the car seat, and would it be helpful if that was displayed to the jury so that you could describe what your findings were? Yes, I did prepare the graph, and, and I think it is a good illustration to, to discuss the temperature. Looking at states 385, is that that graph that shows the three uh, temperature gauges that were placed on the car seat that monitored the temperature uh, throughout the day on July the 8th of 2014? Yes, it is. And then going back to 379, there's a digital version of this graph as well. I think it's PDF form. Is that correct? Well, what I looked at on the thumb drive yes. matches what I'm seeing in the paper. Right. This time, Judge, I would tender 381, 382, 383, 384. 385 and then 379. Objection. Start. I look at some of the photographs on 379. Can you see that or no? Can you move it closer? You're good? Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Starting with State's Exhibit 379, and this would correspond to Exhibit 381 that the jury will have back in the jury room. Can you describe what's depicted here in 381? Uh, this is the vehicle that was being tested that day, and it's parked in the Home Depot parking lot. I'm going to talk about where it's specifically parked in just a moment. I want to ask you some questions first about some of the things that are visible around this vehicle. Uh, first of all, this pop-up canopy tent, can you explain what that is? Uh, we just put a canopy tent in the background that we have our data recorder underneath that tent on a rolling cart, and then we had some other various items that we had just stored underneath there during the day. Inside this vehicle, is there a car seat that's placed in the center of the, the, the back bench? Yes. And did you put three heat sensors on that car seat that, so that you could monitor the temperature throughout the day? Yes, and I, and I would say instead of the use of the word heat sensors, I would just say temperature recording devices. But yes, there was three in the car seat. Fair enough. Um, looking at State's Exhibit 382, we'll go to the version on 379. It's that vehicle from a different angle, is that correct? That's correct. And these, this series of photographs, from my recollection, is. Again, periodically, I would walk around the vehicle and take photos. I had video running, but also just on occasion would walk around the vehicle and, and take snapshots around it. 
this jury yesterday saw this vehicle parked in uh, the, the same spot uh, at, in the Home Depot parking lot. So I want to ask you about that because we need to make a record as well. Are there two, uh, I don't know what you call them, two little islands that have trees that it's parked in between? Yes, some pine straw islands nearby. And so that we can get our bearings in the background of this particular exhibit, which is 382. Uh, can you see a little shed that might give us some guidance when we look at these aerials just to compare? Yes, at the uh, top of the vehicle in the left corner, right behind that is a shed. And then we'll just scroll through these real quick. States Exhibit 383. That's the vehicle from the front, correct? Just to confirm the location of where it was placed, correct? Yes, this would be more of a view looking from the Home Depot building that was in the parking lot back towards the vehicle. And of course, these observers here, one of these observers here in the courtroom, one of our investigators of the Cobb DA's office, um, do, you, do you recognize these? And is, is this one of your employees or assistants? Uh, that may be from this distance. Blue. That's Eric Monroe. That's an engineer that was out there assisting me. We're now on Stakes Exhibits 384, just from a different vantage point, is that correct? Yes. And then 3... This is on <coughs> the last photograph. I'm not sure where I put that, but that's the same vehicle from, from the um, uh, driver's side perspective, correct? That's correct. All right. Now, um, looking at this vehicle, were you able to um, gather evidence and document the temperature both inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle throughout the day? Yes. I want to talk about the parking spot that was used here. We marked this on both the state's and defense's exhibits, just to be fair to both sides. So I'm going to show you what's been previously marked, identified, and admitted as State's Exhibit 231. You've seen this exhibit before. We looked at it both yesterday and today, correct? That's correct. Okay. And uh, I ask you to assist me in placing a red tab on the specific spot that's in this parking lot so that we could confirm it's in the exact spot that we saw in the, the Home Depot video. Does that accurately mark the spot where the vehicle was, was placed in between those two islands with the trees? It does. And then similarly, Again, to be fair to both sides, uh, this is the fence exhibit. I can't make that out. I don't know what exhibit number that is. I'm not sure. Somebody come look at what number that is. It's all over. You want to confirm? Yeah, I'm sure. Look at the state's, excuse me, defendant's exhibit 35, the aerial that was uh, produced by the defense. It, it, this is the same parking lot, correct? Yes. All right, and having looked at both of these exhibits, is that the, the same spot that's depicted here on the photographs that were shown to the jury um, as documented in the Home Depot video that was, was seen yesterday? It is. Okay. Now, having placed this vehicle in that spot, you were able to gauge the temperatures um, outside and inside the vehicle, correct? Yes. All right. I want to go to the Home Depot. Excuse me. I want to go to the Dobbins record. Third page back. <coughs> the highest temperature listed on the Dobbins records for June the 18th of 2014. It's about 92 degrees. The average here in the last column converted uh, temperature is 91 degrees. And it's got a, a time as well, local time, which would be about 1558. What's the hottest it got on July the 8th, 2014, less than three weeks after this date to have a comparison? Uh, based on my data, it was 91 degrees Fahrenheit. It was the maximum outdoor air temperature. Okay, so 92 on June the 18th per the Dobbins record, which would be states exhibit 386 about a degree off 
in, in terms of, uh, of the, the uh, temperature just three weeks later, correct? On the maximum, yes. And did you document the temperature throughout uh, uh, the day um, on the exterior of the vehicle so we can have a comparison to what the actual temperature was from June uh, the 18th of 2014? I did. We were using a thermocouple system for the interior temperatures. I was using a separate device for the exterior humidity and temperature. And that recording system makes a paper chart, essentially. So I have a paper chart showing the variation in outdoor temperature throughout that day. All right. Let's go through some of these times just so we can have a comparison. Do you have those uh, notated in front of you? And I want to start with the morning temperature. So if the Dobbin records show uh, local time around 9 o'clock, 78 degrees, give or take. Uh, what was the temperature that you had? 78.8 is what the Dobbins record show from uh, July the 8th, or uh, June the 18th. Yeah, so at, at 9 a.m. on the day of my testing, the outdoor temperature was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, okay. so w w within a degree or so, if it's 78.8 from the Dobbins records, correct? It speaks for itself, but yes. Okay, let's go to uh, noon time at 11.58 for the local records. 386 from Dobbins. Uh, temperature here is 86.0. What's the temperature that you documented less than three weeks later? We were at 88 degrees Fahrenheit at that time. Okay, so a couple of degrees different. Uh, let's look at one o'clock. I've got 1258 local time here. Uh, what temperature did you show? The Dobbins record show 87.8. Uh, we were at 88 at that point, and at about that time, the recorder itself, the temperature shortly after 1 o'clock uh, jumped from 88 to 91 within about a 15-minute period, 20. Okay, so that, let's, let's look at that 91. That's, that's the peak time for the, the day that you did your testing, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> All right, so at 1558, which would be almost 4 o'clock, 358 in the afternoon, uh, Dobbins records show for June the 18th of 2014 um, could be as high as 92, but the average in the last column was 91.4. What's the temperature you gauge on your testing from July the 8th? Uh, it was 91. Roughly the same testing uh, temperature then? Well, again, it's uh, from a heat transfer standpoint for this issue, essentially the same, but again, a degree or two off, depending. And then I want to talk about 4 o'clock, closest temperature we have to 4 o'clock on June the 18th of 2014, per the Dobbins Air Force Base record, would be 1558 hours, which is 358 in the afternoon. Uh, what was the temperature you gauged today? Uh, 91 still. Okay. And this was 91.4. Here in the last column. Correct? That's what that sheet shows. All right. So now I've established that it's essentially the same temperature outside July the 8th of 2014 as it was on June the 18th of 2014. I want to ask you about the temperature readings inside the vehicle. How did you gather the temperature readings from the car seat inside the vehicle? Well, again, we use thermal couples, and essentially a thermal couple various styles but it's two wires in our case where they're twisted together and what happens is the electrical resistance of the wire changes with temperature so there's a low current going through the wire the data recording system is tracking any essentially resistance or voltage change and it converts that to a temperature so these individual twisted wires that uh, I placed at various locations in particular for the car seat at three different I want to take a look at what's now still displayed for the Kajeri Estates Exhibit 381 from Thumb Drive 379. For most of the day that you were there documenting the measurements of the temperature inside and outside of the vehicle, was the vehicle in direct sunlight? Uh, it, it just depends. It, um, it was not in any sunlight until about 10 o'clock in the morning. Up until that point, the neighboring trees were shading the vehicle from sunlight. Mm -hmm. Starting at 10 a.m., sun started to reach the front of the car. And then, uh, as far as the sun itself went, the sun was shining on the parking lot up until about 11.30 in the morning. And again, this is illustrated through the video I was recording. 
from 11.30 till uh, almost 1 o'clock, it was in and out of sun. But then we had a period of time uh, from about 1 o'clock until 2.30 where it was pretty much direct sunshine. As is depicted on the photograph in front of the jury? Yes, that would be representative of uh, direct sunshine, if you will. All right, and when did you begin the actual um, testing or the actual recording of the temperature inside the vehicle from the car seat? Uh, we re began our recording at about 9 a.m., or yes, 9 a.m. Prior to that, was the vehicle, <coughs> did you run the vehicle and turn on the air conditioning so that you could, you could uh, uh, create a, a circumstance as if the vehicle had just been parked there? We had, I had operated the vehicle for about 30 minutes and then, although we started recording temperatures inside at 9, we actually physically parked the vehicle at 8.22 a.m. So uh, a little before 8 o'clock, I'd have to look at a video again. Uh, I was driving the vehicle, uh, partly to let the engine reach full operating temperature. Also, as far as the air conditioning settings, uh, what was as found in the vehicle is, is where, I, where the setting was. So I didn't alter the setting. Uh, they were set for the AC to be on. So I drove the vehicle for about 20 minutes or so, or 30, uh, with the air conditioning on, and then at 8.22 a.m. parked it in the, in the spot depicted in that photograph. Okay. And then um, in the 9 o'clock hour, did you begin recording temperatures at any point? Yes. At right about 9 a.m. is when we began our thermal temperature recordings. And um, why don't you describe to the jury what was the internal temperature near the car seat location around 9 o'clock in the morning? Uh, because of the AC running, it was on the order of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And what was the outside temperature um, compared to the inside at that point in the morning? Uh, again, right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's cooler inside the vehicle because of the air conditioning when you initially parked it and started the testing? That's correct. All right. And now I want to ask you, did you see a progression throughout the day of the temperature inside the vehicle rising until uh, the point that you ended your testing? Yes, and essentially two different progressions. Uh, initially, there was a, a certain slope to it, and then later in the day, as I said before, after about 1 o'clock, the sun was bearing down pretty much direct full time, and temperatures continued to rise, but at a faster pace at that point. Having established that initially the car was cooler on the interior than the exterior temperature, can you please articulate to the jury when it is that those temperatures matched up with each other in the day? In other words, when did the temperature inside the vehicle match the external temperature of the day? Uh, right at about 11.35 in the morning. 11.35. And what temperature did you have at 11.35 in the morning? Uh, both at the car seat and the exterior was at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. I want to ask you about a particular point in time, around 12.30, 12.45, were you able to gauge the temperature inside and outside of that vehicle at that time? Yes. What was the external temperature at around 12:45 on the day of your testing? About 98 degrees Fahrenheit at the car. I'm sorry, at the car seat it was 98 degrees Fahrenheit, and on the exterior it was 88. 98 degrees. <clears throat> at 12:45. Yes. And then I want to ask you, Doctor. When is the first time that the interior of that vehicle rose to a level above 100 degrees? It would have been shortly before 1 p.m. All right. Dr. Mahad, just step down for a second. I'm going to get you to walk over with me to the graph. I have a digital version display. This would be stakes 385. <coughs> Looking at states 385, we need to make a description for the record and for the jury. 
this is what can be seen here. What's the left-hand column that the jury is looking at here? What does that depict? That's going to be the uh, air temperature corresponding to each of the graphs. Okay. So if we start at air temperature 55 and the highest that would be on here is 145, is that correct? Yes. And then the bottom part of this graph, describe what this shows for our jury, please. This is just a timeline, so each marking is denoting. So if I want to know a certain time, say 1013, I'd come up, hit the graph, come over and read the temperature. You have a key in the upper left-hand corner of this chart. Describe what that key depicts. It's just verbiage to remind myself of where the uh, thermal couples were. So the in the order of the key is in the order of the graph. So the top red line, this would be a thermal couple placed uh, above the child seat at the forward end of the child seat. How about the light blue line? The light blue would be also above the car seat at the foot end of the car seat. And then this last line, is, I'm going to call it, what, purple? Sure. Uh, so the bottom line, I took one of the thermal couples and twisted it in the fabric of the car seat. And um, notably, your results showed that the temperature basically tracked each other at the different points of, uh, of the car seat. Is that accurate? That's correct. And the other thing, too, as I mentioned before, I had a variety of thermal couples in there. So I also had thermal couples near the ceiling of the car and the floorboard. And that data I also looked at at one point just to uh, get an idea of how the data was tracking. Because these three are about the same height in this car, they track together. And if you looked at a similar series of graphs at the top of the car, they also track together at a higher temperature. And then, of course, the floorboard is a lower temperature. And you say, of course, the floorboard, because it's lower and heat rises, would you expect that it might be a, a lower temperature of the floorboard versus a higher uh, point, such as the car seat or maybe even the, a visor? Yeah, that's, yeah, so that's, that's the heat transfer principle. Okay. So these three are actually focused on the car seat itself, since that's the subject matter of this particular case, correct? That's what it's disclosed, yes. And um, here at 926, uh, what what can be displayed here? What does this graph indicate to you in terms of w what's happening with the temperature inside that vehicle near the car seat? Uh, simply again, that because of the AC setting, the car seat area is on the order of 65 Fahrenheit, maybe a little less. And what it's showing is once we park the vehicle, and again the air the AC has been off now, that now the outdoor air being warmer than the inside, the car car seat area is beginning to warm up. And then I want to look at some various times here. I'd asked you specifically about uh, 1245. That would fall in between two times that are basically <coughs> dead center on your graph. Is that correct? Yes, that's fair to say. So let's take the, the, the low and the high. At 1234 p.m. using your graph, you can move up here and let's see. Is that about accurate? You know, it's a touch screen. You can touch basically where it is. Right. And what was the temperature that you documented around that time? Well, again, as you can see around that time at 1234, <laughs> at least above the car seat area, uh, it's at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, because I want to focus on that period of time, around 1250, uh, if I'm getting that up right. Uh, 1250, uh, we've risen about three degrees to 98. And then I want to talk to you about reaching the temperature in excess of 100 degrees. Uh, about what time did you find that in your documentation as you were recording the temperatures inside the vehicle? Well, 100 degrees would be a uh, midpoint between our two black lines. So if I come down, again, just roughly about 1 o'clock in the afternoon is where the uh, 100, whoops, excuse me, make sure, where the 100 degree reading would be. Okay. Right in there is 105, so uh, somewhere lower than that. Yes. And then the peak period of time in terms of your sensors recording activity um, at the peak, what temperature did you gauge at that car seat? Well, again, based on the graph, we can go back to the black line, uh, right at about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And what time of day was that when it reached 125 degrees? Uh, this would have been, again going down, approximately 3.30. And then finally on your graph, the last time that you had depicted here is about 4.14 in the afternoon, 4.15, is that correct? Yes. And what was the temperature then when the vehicle was access accessed? Uh, probably just a little above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You can take your seat, please. <coughs>
Good point. Too. Some of our jurors may not be familiar with Cobb County. I sometimes forget that we're, we're not, not home in Cobb where people may know what different things are. Do you know what Dobbins Air Force Base is? I do. Okay, and, and just explain uh, where, where is that um, in, in terms of uh, Cobb County? Uh, Dobbins Air Force Base is just a little south of area of city proper. Uh, with relation to the Home Depot property, it would be north of this site, and I believe a little bit to the east. Okay, so it's very close, certainly within the county, um, where the Home Depot treehouse is located, is that correct? Uh, both are within the same county, and relatively speaking, it's a close data recording station. A pretty easy drive to each other, correct? Yes. All right. Except for Atlanta traffic. <laughs> yes, sir. I think that's all I have at this time. Well, is in the house. I'm showing you what's been previously marked in the defendant's exhibit 46. You recognize that as the sheet or the page on your Excel spreadsheet that you created of the external data. <coughs> uh, that, that's the measurements of outside the vehicle on July the 8th, correct? Not quite. It's, uh, there's two things going on. This, this sheet is from my spreadsheet. Uh, the primary it's showing here is the uh, individual data points I recorded uh, approximately every 15 minutes, I think I said before, every hour. This would be wind speed, uh, our light meter readings, sky condition. Uh, also included on that is a snapshot of the temperature values that I read off of our data recorder. But the actual data recording temperatures came off were in the chart portion of the recorder. So this data is data I took, and this is from my spreadsheet. I will move D46 in evidence. I don't have any objection. That, that's your work product, is that correct? Uh, it's part of my file. Yeah, yep. I, I don't have any objection to that. Okay. And I'm showing you what's also been previously marked as Defendant's Exhibit 47. I'm showing you a one page supplemental police report from Cobb County Police Department. Judge, I've shown this to opposing counsel. I'm going to move uh, defendants 47 in. Well, that would be hearsay. It's a one-page lease report prepared by Officer Adam Check, apparently, about what some other person said to him. Your Honor, we, we previously had this issue come up. This is um, an exception to hearsay. This is a public record. <coughs> Pursuant to the Georgia rules, this would be admissible, and for the truth of the matter, and for the for the record, it is a list of temperatures that received from Dobbins Air Force Base. Object to them going into substance of it. It's not been admitted, and um, renew my objection. You say.
showing you what's been admitted as B46. We talked about how it, it doesn't simply have the data points for temperature <coughs> outside, but it also includes measurements for wind, correct? Yes. Humidity? Yes. And, and on the subject of humidity, um, can, I mean, perhaps we all know from our, our common experience, but just from a scientific standpoint, can you explain how humidity affects temperature? In general, humidity, if it was relatively on the high end or it's a very moist environment, it may affect heat transfer in the sense that you get condensation like you would on your car this morning, and that would affect heat transfer. Uh, for the range of humidities for the testing that day, uh, as far as I sit here, I don't believe that has any real bearing on the actual heat transfer mechanisms. Um, well, just to be clear, was there not a heat index on July the 8th? Well, again, my understanding of a heat in index or is, is more for how an individual body would feel in a situation like that. Uh, it doesn't apply to objects that are metals, fabric, whatever. In other words, there's no wind chill associated with the vehicle. Uh, so the, the measurements that you conducted um, doesn't necessarily equate or, or detect how temperature feels to a human. Right. Oh, no, certainly not. All these temperatures are relating is what the air temperature was in the near vicinity of those individual thermocouples. Um, and you used a thermocouple outside to detect external temperature? No, what I was relying on for outside temperature was a temperature humidity recording device, which is a separate system or separate unit. Okay. Did you have a similar unit that detected humidity um, inside the vehicle? No, I was not reporting humidity within the vehicle. You, you would agree that um, a vehicle isn't like 100% sealed off from the outside. I mean, um, if the air vents are on, I mean, air can enter inside the vehicle through the uh, lower compartment of the vehicle through the, the engine, okay? And, and come in inside of these air vents, right? Uh, for this particular vehicle, I can't speak with direct knowledge. All I can say in general is I certainly wouldn't expect the vehicle to be airtight, if you will. Okay, that's a good way of putting it. It's not airtight. Correct. Okay. So certainly um, air from the outside is able to come inside of a vehicle. In theory, it's able to. Uh, again, one of the issues that's, that uh, this testing helps me with though, there's a variety of factors that can affect the, uh, the internal temperature of the vehicle, but because we are taking direct readings, uh, we know what the air temperature was. There's certainly factors that can alter it, some more than others, uh, but regardless of the factors, we just physically just went directly and measured temperatures. Um, what about breathing? Um, would, would heavy breathing affect um, the inside temperature of a vehicle? Well, again, the data I took was testing a vehicle where there was no occupants in it, and all I can speak for is the temperature for a vehicle tested in that scenario. These were the air temperatures, I was, the internal temperatures I was getting for that day. Uh, as far as whether or not uh, the question you've asked, I don't have any idea either way. That wasn't part of the testing I was doing. Okay. Now, um, in, in preparation for setting up the testing in this case, um, you, you testified um, that you tried to read up on some literature. Um, did, you, did you look at any other um, experiments that measured humidity inside of the vehicle? No, the only ones I recall looking at uh, were dealing with reporting on temperatures. Do you know if those temperatures accounted for humidity or heat index? Again, all I can recall is the recording of temperature. Um, but no, with regard to humidity, I'm not aware either way. Okay. 
Um, as far as preparing uh, your protocol for conducting this test, you met with the district attorney's office, correct? Yes, in particular, uh, Bob Tressel is my first point of contact. Okay. Um, you emailed with Bob Tressel, correct? Yes. If, uh, if the trial team had questions about your data, you would communicate through Mr. Bob Tressel? That's correct. You met with uh, members of the Cobb County Police Department? Just in that I think that the, I'd gone out to the Cobb County facility where the vehicle was stored, and I believe in addition to Bob Tressel, there may have been one other person associated with Cobb County there. And then again, on the day of testing, uh, we had, I, th I believe, at least two different people from Cobb County that were out there at some point during the day. Um, do you remember this gentleman sitting here on the front row, Detective Bill Stoddard? Do you remember him on scene on July the 8th, 2014? I do. And anyone else that's sitting behind the state that you recognize from being on scene? Not immediately, but I, in one of the photos we showed earlier, there was a female, and she was, my understanding is she was with Cobb County. And Dr. Brainy, uh, about how much uh, time did you put into your work in this case? Total. I don't have that before me right now. In terms of monetary, it was probably on the order of about $24,000 of work uh, built through ATS for my time and other support. Um, is, is that an hourly rate? It would depend on the individual that's working. Uh, some, some employees involved in the project were a lower hourly rate. Uh, my involvement, I uh, spent Again, off the top of my head, uh, probably a full day between communications and getting out to the site and, and looking at the vehicle initially, uh, another afternoon and instrumenting the vehicle. Of course, a full day of testing at the site. There was also follow-up hours to take care of the data management, and then we also did uh, pre-calibration of equipment, et cetera, that was other time spent. Okay. Um, what is your hourly rate? Uh, I believe my hourly rate for this activity was $295 an hour. Can you ballpark how many hours you put in to research and prepping for the testing? Uh, no, I think it, without looking at other documents, but uh, you know, again, roughly research, I probably spent a couple hours just seeing other studies that were out there. As far as pre-test prepping, uh, again, it may be on the order of 12 hours. And how'd you go about researching um, the other experiments and other studies, other literature that was out there? Well, about like everybody else does, I get on Google and start typing, uh, and then just looking for uh, other folks that may have done this type of testing before. Uh, again, just trying to do a little bit of homework. Uh, yeah, I had a game plan in mind, but I just wanted to reach out to the community and through that type of uh, research just to see what others have done. Um, after Googling, um, who did you reach out to? Uh, I probably have it listed in my file folder. I have a sheet of paper where I had uh, made a synopsis of some of that research. Uh, one of the things I gleaned from it was that uh, there's talk in other papers where the typical change in temperature, in other words, the max temperature within the vehicle versus outside. Past studies uh, typically report on the order of 40 degrees Fahrenheit change. So if you have a vehicle parked in the sun, uh, past studies have shown that the maximum temperature of the vehicle tends to be uh, no greater than about 40 degrees at the outside. And in our data up there, for example, our maximum temperature of 125 is about 35 degrees higher than the 90 degrees outside temperature. So I was just looking at studies like that, one, to, to uh, see if there's anything I need to be aware of in my testing, and two, to look at the post-test data uh, to feel comfortable with what we had. So that's some of the usage of that search, though. Okay. Um, I, did, so 
do I understand your testimony to be that at the conclusion of your testing and you got your results, you compared it to what the other literature and other research out there was? At one point I did. And really just one particular study with the Delta T. I just, there was a study, I believe it was done in Australia, okay. and my recollection is that our temperature tracking was uh, consistent with their findings. Do you recall the name of that Australian study? Not off the top of my head, but again, I'm not relying on that study for the opinions I have here today. Sure. Um, but having been tendered as an expert and having testified that you, you, you researched the work of others in this field, um, you specifically recall this experiment, uh, this study, the Australian one, to compare your work at the end of your testing. Well, again, compare in the sense of it was another study done. Of course, it's not going to be the same vehicle. Uh, I don't recall exactly where their thermal couplings were placed in relation. Um, again, it's just a back of the envelope check to see how our data looked compared to other folks. Did, did the Australian study use thermocouples? My recollection is they did, yes. Do you remember what year? No, I don't. Let, let me move on to uh, the condition of the vehicle. You testified that you went out to the Cobb County Police Department <coughs> and inspected the vehicle at their evidence shed? Right. That's, that's correct. Okay. And were there contents inside the vehicle at that point? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a car seat? Yes. Okay. There was musical equipment? Yes, yeah, so my recollection of the back storage area, there was some, some musical equipment there. Uh, some uh, big amps? That's my recollection, yes. Okay. Um, some, uh, some guitar pedals, did you see that? I didn't recall specifics, but I did take photographs at the time, so the photographs of my file would give an indication of what was in the vehicle at the time of my initial visit to the Cobb County facility. And in the process of setting up your thermocouple wiring um, in order to, to keep the wires fixed in the spots that you wanted, you had to wrap them around things, right? Fixed objects within the vehicle? Yes. Uh, like the rear view mirror, correct? Certainly. Um, in fact, the rear view mirror was one of the data points that you had selected. That's correct. There's a thermocouple that's wrapped around the visor, right? Uh, yeah, that's the, my recollection is that, again, one of the things I did is when we placed the thermocouples, I took photographs of each thermocouple as to how they were uh, placed on the vehicle. So that type of information I recorded. So if someone wanted to know that answer, as far as specifics, memory, uh, I can't recall each specific instance as to how we wrapped or tied or whatever, but the photographs would show that. Okay. Uh, did you review the photographs that you took prior to your testimony today? I have not. Okay. Um, just the, the three or four that the state admitted into evidence? Uh, yes, that's correct. You set up thermocouples um, on top of the car seat, correct? Yes, in fact, it's a uh, a report that I provided to Cobb County and I, I, my understanding was provided to defense. Uh, there was a photograph depicting the three thermal couples near the car seat as far as how they were arranged and, and secured. You testified that one of them is actually twisted and inserted inside the cloth of the car seat, correct? That's correct. Uh, there are two that are kind of floating above the car seat, right? Yes. Okay. And. Um, the ends, the probes of those thermocouples, they're not touching anything, right? That's my recollection. They're not touching an object, so the temperature that it's detecting is in the air, right? Yes, in fact, that's true of all the thermocouples in the vehicle. Well, mm -hmm. the, the thermocouple that is... With the exception of the, the cloth. I'm embedded sorry. in the cloth, it's touching the cloth, right? That's correct. 
And so when heat is absorbed in, in the car seat, in the cloth, that thermocouple is going to detect the heat being stored inside the, the cloth, correct? It's going to get an idea of the cloth's temperature near its upper layer. The general premise of this car is it's complicated in the sense that you have a variety of materials, and each material by their bulk can retain a certain amount of energy. So for example, as the sun is shining on the vehicle, the reception of that heat from the sun depends in part on the material itself. Certain painted colors absorb heat differently than the sun from others. Likewise, those objects in the vehicles, whether it's a car seat or a seat in the vehicle, as they're receiving heat from the sun, they can also store, they have a capacity to store heat. So you have all these objects within the vehicle that are reacting differently from the sun. In turn, those objects, as they're being heated, they're interacting with the air in the vehicle. So you have all of this heat transfer between things. And at the end of the day, the data we were after is just simply uh, what was the air temperature in the near vicinity, for example, of the car seat and these other areas I just instrumented up. As far as being embedded in the cloth seat, because it's not truly just out in the air, uh, you're going to have a difference because of the solid cloth seat, etc. So yeah, it, it, an object is going to behave differently if you were looking at the temperature. If you're looking at the temperature below the car seat a little bit, it would be a little different than the air. Uh, and, and because you were measuring a vehicle with an empty car seat that didn't account for <coughs> humidity inside that vehicle, you'd agree that your experiment, your testing, wouldn't account for the heat that comes off and emanates from a human being and is stored inside that car seat and is circulating within the compartment of that vehicle. I think from my aspect of it, that particular issue, obviously we didn't have uh, someone in the vehicle from a just general heat transfer characteristics. If the item in the vehicle is, is a warmer temperature than the surrounding air in the vehicle, then that's acting as a heat source to the vehicle. So in our testing, our primary heat source as the day progressed was the sun. Early in the morning, uh, if you have a body in there, they're going to be adding heat to the vehicle. So that's one factor. Uh, now, is, is, that based on, is that based on your experience and your training, or is that just kind of a common sense understanding of greenhouse effect and the way that our bodies work? Based on experience in the sense of I'm not talking so much of a person now, but just of an object at a temperature. So if I were to take an object and place it in the vehicle, let's suppose that object was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in the morning, the vehicle temperature started out in the 60s because of the air conditioning. So if a body is in the, in the car and it's at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, just to pick a value, it would be adding heat that would not have been captured during my testing. So in theory, the temperature may be a little warmer where that body was. Uh, just an aspect like that. Okay. And what about like a big amplifier box that had been sitting in the car for who knows how long? Um, I mean, that item would also, depending on how hot it got, it would generate as a secondary heat source inside the vehicle. No, because the, the object itself is not actually generating any heat. The object is just responding to heat transfer to it and from it in a temperature. A human body is actually generating heat. If you can think of a, um, if I had a bucket of water and the water was being heated, well, that bucket of water is, is serving as a heat generation. But if I had that same bucket of water and I wasn't heating or cooling, now it's just an object that's either <coughs> responding to, absorbing heat, or letting in and of, in of itself is not generating heat. Okay. So, um, I mean, in this case, y'all made, I mean, y'all took steps to make sure that the objects that were inside the vehicle when it was found on June the 18th, 2014, 
remained in the vehicle for, you, for purposes of your testing, um, but the items that were there, that they wouldn't contribute to the temperature inside the vehicle? They contribute in the sense, again, as you have the heat from the sun coming in, depending on where that object is, if it's seeing sunlight and its properties of that object, it's going to respond by absorbing heat from the sun a certain way. In turn, it's going to be losing heat or, or affecting the heat of the air of the vehicle. Uh, but I wouldn't expect whether it's an amplifier or something else, uh, it would have no greater or less influence than any other parts of the interior of the car. And, I, and at the end of the day, the nuances I, I would expect would be very minimal. Uh, in other words, if we ran this test without the amps, for example, uh, I don't think you'd see any real temperature change. May I ask why you made sure that they were still in the vehicle then? Uh, I didn't personally make sure. That was how the vehicle was presented to me from Cobb County when we instituted it up. My understanding was that the items in the vehicle were the same at the time the vehicle was, I guess, impounded, uh, short of the car seat itself was an exemplar car seat. Uh, from my standpoint, as you'd mentioned before, uh, cars can leak air, etc. Of course, different cars can leak different amounts. So trying to do a test that's apples to apples as best as possible, uh, obviously using the same vehicle, parking in the same spot, things like that. As far as individual components in the vehicle, uh, my recollection is that it's the same with the data loss, but again, I don't think it's a big influence either way on the, on the outcome. Did I hear you correctly that you used an exemplar car seat? I didn't personally use it. An exemplar car seat was in the vehicle. In other words, that wasn't the original car seat? That's my understanding. Okay. And who told you that? Uh, it would have been either Bob Tressel or one of the others at Cobb County. When was it taken out? That I don't know. <clears throat> when was the um, second car seat put in? Again, I, all I know is when I saw the vehicle uh, for the first time, my understanding was that it was a different car seat. Same make and model is my understanding, but not the car seat. In, in preparing your report, is, is it... Uh, having reviewed it, is, is it uh, accurate that you operated the vehicle, Mr. Harris's SUV, uh, for approximately 30 minutes and then parked the vehicle at 8.22 in the morning? Yes. Okay. Um, whose decision was it to drive the vehicle for 30 minutes? That was my decision. Okay. Um, so there wasn't anything about the drive time and your decision to drive for 30 minutes that was done to replicate anything on June the 18th? Only in the sense that my understanding was the vehicle had, of course, been driven for some period of time before it being parked. So what I did is pick a time where I felt that the engine had fully come up to temperature and the AC had a chance to fully air condition the cabin. Were you made aware that um, on the morning of June the 18th, Mr. Harris drove from his home to Chick-fil-A, parked, went inside and had breakfast with his son for 15, 20 minutes, got back in the car, and then drove to the Treehouse parking lot? I had an understanding that, that at some point they had gone to the Chick-fil-A as far as exact timelines what actually was done or whatever, I, I don't have any knowledge on that at all. I just, I just knew in general the vehicle had been operated before it was parked there. Uh, but I wasn't taking into account that exact timeline of the decisions I was making for my testing. Okay. Um, I mean, you, you really have no way of knowing then if the starting temperature for your testing was similar to the starting temperature on June the 18th at the Home Depot parking lot. Could you repeat the question? Sure. 
on June the 18th, when Mr. Harris shuts the door and goes into work at 9.25 in the morning. You don't know if the starting temperature at that point is similar to the starting temperature for your testing at 8.22 in the morning on July the 8th. If there's that hour difference, uh, I would not. On the other hand, essentially, from the testing that I did, at some point, the air in the car, the conditioned air, of course, it's being heated. At that time, the sun's not on the car yet. So at some point, the car is attempting to reach the same temperature as the outside. But I do want to point out, just to, to uh, be careful with how this data is read, is whatever is really happening before 1130, it's dictating what temperature the car would have been at that time, but it's not affecting what happens in the afternoon time. By the afternoon time, from a heat transfer standpoint, uh, those initial factors of the car are no longer in play. So what we're talking about here is that the vehicle was parked uh, an hour later than when I parked it. I would expect the vehicle at that time to be cooler than my values, because the, if the AC had been on, so I would expect the interior of the car to be less on the day of the incident than it was on the day of my testing, based on what you're telling me as far as when the car was parked. I'm not sure I understand how, we need to be careful about reading your data points in the morning and then not having a, an effect on the temperatures in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and so that the jury understands your evidence, well, you know, why should they be careful about looking at your data? Just be cautious about how to read it. In other words, if, if I've turned the vehicle AC on at 9 in the morning and had it running, and I shut the vehicle off then, when I get to 1 o'clock in the afternoon of the day of our testing, it's my experience in heat transfer and thermodynamics that that residual cooling has long been taken care of, essentially. So running the AC an additional hour, for example, and shutting down, it may make a difference in the vehicle temperature in the near frame of time that morning. But as time progresses, that gets washed out by the other transfer effects. Uh, but but and to be fair, um, you weren't made aware that Mr. Harris was running his AC for an hour before he parked his vehicle on June the 18th, 2014. No, but on the flip side, I tried to run the AC for what I thought was a substantial amount of time so the cabin could have a chance to cool down. So I was running it in the settings as found. One of the temperature settings was 65 Fahrenheit on the dash. And I ran it for 30 minutes on a day that was essentially 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So the AC was activated for that full time. Uh, but, as, Sorry. but as far as uh, the length of time compared to what it was actually run, no, that wasn't the intent of that. What's nice about Georgia is that uh, you know, the, temp the temperature can and the weather can change in an instant. We've experienced that. Um, but there are times in the summer where the mornings are very, very comfortable, correct? And then there's a pretty extreme rise in temperature throughout the day, correct? Well, again, in general for the weather, yes, sure. Okay. You have no idea Mr. Harris was actually running his air conditioning the morning of June the 18th, 2014, do you? Well, again, all I can tell you is that was the settings as I found it on the vehicle uh, when I did my testing. And those were the settings as you found the vehicle after Mr. Harris got into his car after 4 o'clock on June the 18th when it was a very hot summer's day, correct? That's my understanding is the last setting would have been late in the afternoon. And the, the Dobbins Air Force Base temperatures have, have been admitted in the evidence. It's a lot hard, uh, hotter at the end of the day than it is at the very beginning of the morning. 
Well, again, though, for my testing, not knowing the AC settings and attempting to get the temperatures in the vehicle, I certainly didn't want to do testing that uh, I wanted to get a conservative value. So I knew that running the air conditioning, for example, would tend to drive down the temperatures in the early morning than, for example, if I just ran the heater. So my choice was just to run the air conditioning, knowing that that would be conservative as far as how the vehicle air temperature went in the morning time. Showing what's been pre marked for identification purposes is D48. That's a photograph that you took, correct? Right? Yes. And the photograph you took in the testing of the air temperature in this case on July the 18th. <coughs> yes. I'm going to move to D48. No objection. Um, you'd agree that this photograph shows a time of 823, correct? I'd have to see it again. Okay. Yes. Okay. 8.23. All right. <coughs> and you notice that there's a reading for the outside temperature there. Yes. Okay. And that is 74 degrees. Yes. Okay. Um, at... 855. At 855, this is the internal temperature. Do you have your external temperature there? Uh, I have 78 degrees Fahrenheit. 78 degrees. Do, do you know why there's a four degree discrepancy between the air temperature? that you detected in the air temperature in the vehicle? Well, again, I think that air temperature, is, it's recording of what it thinks the outside temperature is. Correct. Uh, no, I don't. I can tell you that based on my own vehicles, uh, quite often when I look at its recording of the outside temperature, it seems to differ from what's being reported on the radio, for example. Uh, but as far as why there's a difference there, I don't know. Okay. Depending on what you're using to detect temperature, you may not get the same result, right? The same reading. Depending on where the monitoring is being done, yes. And looking at your, your chart here, do you agree that at 9, uh, between 9-11 and 9-26, the car seat has been cooled down to just above 60 degrees? That would be the thermal couple that's above the, the, the air above the forward part of the car seat. Okay. Um, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, typically in the summer when we're running our AC, we wouldn't lower our homes down to 62 degrees. Well, again, all I can tell you is that I started with the AC setting that I had. I let it run for 30 minutes. Uh, I'm trying to recall how comfortable or not I was in the vehicle time. I, I recall it was cold. Uh, but as far as whether or not that's a low temperature cabin for someone driving at that time of day, I, I don't have a thought either way on that because that really doesn't affect the opinions I have. But it was, it was certainly cool in the car when I exited. And you have, you've been provided no information, no evidence that on June the 18th, 2014, that the car seat was cooled to just above 60 degrees. 
Well, again, as far as evidence of what the temperatures were on the actual date of loss that were truly in the vehicle at the time, I do not. Uh, it's possible that if someone had not run the AC as its lowest setting, for instance, in the morning, then again, I think this is the more conservative that the coolest temperatures I'd expect at the car seat would have been in the 60s as we're talking about. Certainly, if someone's in the cabin adjusting for morning, it may be higher than that. They, they may not even have the AC on at all. Well, yeah, that's correct, yeah. In other words, if, if the AC is not on at all, you may have temperatures that are more akin to the outside temperature of uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But my point is with, with this subject is this, when you look at the graph on the far left, if we had started out at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I would expect in the early hour, two hours, that that would make somewhat of a difference in how the temperature data would track, of course. But as the course of the day would go on, I wouldn't expect it to have any difference. Uh, at best, our temperature curves uh, may track a little higher in the morning hour. But in the afternoon hours, that residual start temperature wouldn't matter by then. <clears throat> I believe you testified that this parking spot that Mr. Harris parked in was um, mostly shaded throughout the morning, correct? Uh, until 10 a.m. Until 10 a.m.? Did you notice the layout of this parking lot when, um, you, were, when you were driving it for 30 minutes? And, and so that the jury understands. You didn't take this Tucson outside of the parking lot and traversing the busy Atlanta traffic. No, we stayed within the parking lot. Okay, yeah. You, so you were doing basically laps around this parking lot for 30 minutes. Yes. So you got a really good view of all these parking spaces, right? Not necessarily. I was primarily just focused on driving the vehicle. Okay. Driving safely, I guess. Certainly. Did you adjust the mirrors at all to make sure that uh, you know, nobody was coming behind you or that you weren't going to cut somebody off? No. Again, the purpose of the test, I was trying to leave the vehicle as close as possible as the asphalt condition, so I purposely didn't do any adjustments like that. Okay. All right. Well, um, you, you'd agree that a spot like right here, do you see that where my pen is pointing? Yes. Okay. Um, it doesn't have three big trees surrounding it like the spot that Mr. Harris parked in. Uh, the photograph speaks for itself, yes. Okay. Um, you would agree with me that the spot that Mr. Harris parked in, those three trees and the tree line behind it provided shade for that spot. Well, again, part of the data that I took was to run a video monitoring the car at all times so that the shade of the trees could be monitored versus the sun. And, and the bottom line is for that particular spot, my knowledge is that the sun starts to touch upon the car at 10 a.m. As far as what happens in other spots, I don't have any recollection okay. to record that. In your report, you, you had indicated that there's um, two discrepancies that you noticed in, in your data, correct? That's correct. Okay. And one of those discrepancies was um, something that you called drift effect. Yes. Um, simply put, is that a, um, a change in the temperature? It's a function of our data recording system. So our data recording system software had two different settings on it. One setting was uh, 
in play if it was accounting for variations around the recorder. The default from the manufacturer was to have that option turned off. My preference on the day of testing would have had that option on, and I wasn't aware of that setting. So what we found at the end of the day is when we look back at our raw data, that we had turned off and on the unit at two different times and noticed a discrepancy in the end temperature at the stop of one run and the start temperature at the stop, start of the other. So for example, at 11.30 in the morning, I had my engineer shut down the system and restart. The purpose for it was I wanted to make sure our data was being saved properly. We'd been out there for about two and a half hours. And out of caution, I wanted to make sure we were capturing the data. I didn't want to go the whole day and find out something wasn't being captured. To do that, we had to turn the software off momentarily, <coughs> save the data, and then restart. And what I noticed when I got done with my testing the next day and looking at the data is that the end temperature at the end of the one run differed by about six degrees from the start temperature of the next run. And what council is bringing up, what I call drift in my report, is that after we discovered that, we did some extensive follow-up testing at our lab, had some contact with the manufacturer of the system, and what we concluded in our testing is because the switch setting was, the default was in the position it was, that the unit itself, all of the data would drift together, and it was over a time period. So the longer the unit operated, this drift would get more and more. So in our data set, after about three hours, the drift was on the order of six degrees. And the way to think about it then is when we restart the system, it's always reading true. There's no drift in the restart value. The drift is in the end value. So what you're seeing in the reflection of the curves here is we took our raw data, recognizing this drift, and put a correction in for it. And that's what this data represents. But the actual raw data itself, we had this drift in there. So after on the order of three hours, we'd have a six degree drift. And that's what I was reporting on my report to <coughs> Powell County, in my understanding, to the defense as well. Okay. Um, and it's your opinion that in all cases, when the unit, I'm talking about the unit, it's your, your testing mechanism, is initially started, the data recorded is unbiased. Okay, and that's consistent to what you just explained to the jury. And as time progresses, the drift in data becomes more prominent, right? That's correct. It, it becomes less accurate. The raw data itself is straying from what the true values should be, okay. yes. How, how do you know what the true values should be? Well, that was the fortunate side, is every time we restarted the system, we had a start point that we knew was, was accurate within the uncertainty of the reading equipment. That happened at two different times. Essentially at 11.30 in the morning, we performed a restart, and again at 2.30 in the afternoon. So both at 11.30 and 2.30, there was no drift associated with the data at all. But again, to answer your question though, because I had that restart and I knew where the point should be versus where it was in the raw data, I could then interpolate the data so that it would uh, account for this drift. And, I mean, this sounds really complicated, and I don't mean any disrespect, but could you have just put a thermometer inside the vehicle and taken photographs of it from inside throughout the day? I mean, wouldn't that be a measure of the temperature inside the vehicle? It would be one mechanism of it. The trouble with a basic just bulb thermometer is I don't get a continuous reading. I'd have to periodically check it. Uh, that's partly why things like thermal couple systems have been invented, so you don't you can do these things remotely. Uh, certainly, in hindsight, there's all sorts of things. I certainly wish that default switch was set to accommodate for the drift factor, uh, but it wasn't. So when I discovered this issue, uh, out of abundance of caution, the last thing I wanted to do was provide misleading information, especially to those trying the facts. And again, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the data uh, to make sure that what you're seeing up there on that graph is what I believe to be a, an accurate reflection of the temperatures. On the other hand, uh, one can certainly graph the raw data as it exists, and we can talk about that data as well. And 
the raw data in a sense would be more conservative as far as temperature rise because the drift in the first two segments was always under predicting the temperature. So when we turned off the unit, it thought it was at this value. For example, at 11.36 a.m., The unit was reading due to drift uh, about 82 degrees Fahrenheit at the child care seat. When we restarted, it was actually 88. So what's reflected there is taking the drift out, but I would have no problem discussing data with respect to the actual raw data as well. Just keeping in mind the raw data is going to be more conservative or is going to be reflecting lower temperatures. The raw data, the temperatures that, that you've reported are going to be less than the actual temperatures inside the vehicle. It's going to be less, especially at the tail end. Always remember when the data started up each time, there is no drift. So as time progresses, and it's a slow progression, at the end of about two and a half hours, we get about a six to six degree temperature drift. So if we were putting the raw data up there around 1130, uh, it would be recording essentially a value six degrees lower at 1136 than what it truly was. Right. Um, what, what I think might be difficult for <coughs> members of the jury to understand is, based on your testimony, um, a vehicle can be closed, three hours can go by, and according to this testing, we should expect the outside temperature to be the same as <coughs> the inside temperature of the vehicle. Um, I mean, can you explain why that may not jive with just our own personal experiences? Uh, again, all I can speak for is the testing we did that day. So for this particular vehicle, with the AC run for that period of time, that it took until uh, 11.30 before the inside and outside caught up to each other. But again, my one of the things I want to point out with this data is that the issues we're talking about in the morning, all these variables that could come in, whether the AC was run, whether the AC was not run, from my perspective, my academic training and background, uh, I would not expect any of those variables to have any meaningful effect on the temperatures, especially in the afternoon except for a human being being inside that vehicle and humidity affecting the temperature inside that vehicle. That, that, that is a variable that you didn't account for and would affect the temperature inside the vehicle. I didn't account for it, but based again on my understanding of heat transfer, the primary objects in the vehicle, they would not be affected by the humidity in the air. Uh, at one point in my graduate work, uh, my thesis evolved around radiation and penetrating through the atmosphere and a factor in that can be humidity but based on that training and understanding as far as this particular testing goes whether it's 30 percent humid or 60 percent humid which is relatively high for an outdoors uh, it would not really make any significant difference on the air recording temperatures that day what may make a difference is if you have a body that can be its own generation of heat and we've talked about that before. But as far as the overall effect of what the humidity was in the car, short of it dripping wet, uh, it wouldn't make any difference in this, in this study. Right, because inanimate objects aren't, they, they don't, they're not affected by the heat index. The heat index doesn't mean anything to a pen or an amplifier, but the heat index accounts for how humans feel when there is humidity and heat. Well, again, my background is not relating air temperature to how humans would feel. That's somebody else's area of study. All I can tell you is on that particular day, without a person in it, these were the kind of temperatures that were occurring. Um, when, when, you were, when you were Googling to look at the literature, um, did, did you come across studies since the 70s that examined the, the internal environment of motor vehicles? 
I don't recall that specific. I, again, I recall one report in Australia that it seemed to be a, been done in the 90s or 2000s. Well, but I didn't do any vast literature research of car vehicle temperatures. I just did a survey to help me understand and, and uh, come up with a game plan. I already had a thought process, and that type of study is just reconfirmed what I was planning on doing with air temperature measurements as what others have done in the past. Did, did you come across a demonstration uh, of a Dr. Ernie Ward determining how hot it gets in a parked car, and over the span of 30 minutes, it gets to be over 100 degrees inside that vehicle? I don't remember a specific study. I have seen studies where there's discussions of, uh, depending on the circumstance, you have a, on the order of a 20 degrees Fahrenheit rise within a matter of an hour. Uh, again, I use that just based on my own data. If you look at when we get to about 1 o'clock, that's when the sun hits a period where it's shining continuously on the car for about two and a half hours. And the graph speaks for itself, but you can see the rise in the curves responding to it. And again, the temperature rises on the order of about 20 degrees in an hour or so. So those studies, again, all I was looking for was just if there's anything that seemed out of um, context with the data I took, and I didn't see anything. As far as more specific things of human bodies and things, I just simply wasn't looking for that information at the time. Did, did you come across PSAs that, that have studied and discussed how dramatically hot it can get within a vehicle within 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? No, other than just uh, confirmation that the temperatures that we achieved are not out of line with other studies. So much depends, again, depending on the, the air temperature outside the vehicle, depending on the type of vehicle, depending on what the sun's doing. Uh, all these are factors. All I can tell you, regardless of any studies out there, is this is a good representation of the temperatures on the day that I did testing. But not a good indication of how hot it was for Cooper Harris and how hot it was inside that vehicle. I the think it's... and afternoon of June 18, 2014. I would disagree in that the temperatures displayed there were for July 8th based on the weather reports of what was going on on June 18th, three weeks later, three weeks prior. Uh, the key ingredients to me is outdoor temperature and the amount of sunlight lighting on the vehicle. And certainly outdoor temperature, as we talked about before, matched well with what's on June 18th. The other issue would be the sun. And I can tell you what the sun was doing that day. I haven't looked back for detailed studies on what the sun was doing on June 18th, but those are the two main factors governing the temperature in the vehicle. So discussions of what the cabin temperature was at the start of our test, to me that's really a non-factor for those temperature ranges. Um, so yes, I would say this is useful information to help the jury better decide on their deliberations as far as what their temperature was in the vehicle at the time, short of the physical body being in it, of course. And, uh I'm not suggesting that your test should have included a human being or that you should have sat in there to see how hot it felt to you, but there is a way to measure heat index, correct? I'm sure there is. It's not something I've done before. But again, there's no point in me doing it because for this testing, I don't have a person in the vehicle. I'm just simply measuring air temperature in response to inanimate, inanimate objects within the vehicle and the vehicle itself. I mean, there's no, there was no reason in my testing to consider heat index. And with all due respect, you, you were hired on a case where a child had died in a hot car, and you knew that, right? Certainly. Right. And the whole purpose of your testimony and your testing is to give this jury an idea of the temperature inside that vehicle on June the 18th. 2014, where there was a human being inside that vehicle. Yes, and I think this data does provide insight to that because, again, a body in the vehicle in the morning, it's going to generate heat. So in the morning, that body is actually going to add heat to the cabin air, and to some degree, it's going to raise the temperature cabin air more than my data shows. 
Conversely, unfortunately, at some point, uh, some point the body may quit generating heat, and it's and like passing away. Certainly, but the bottom line on this is that whether there's a person in it or not, I personally wouldn't expect, from my experiences in heat transfer, that it would make a substantial difference in cabin air temperature. Uh, especially in general in the cabin. I mean, you may, you may say, well, it may vary three, four degrees, for example, but certainly not on any real order of magnitude. So I think this data is useful uh, to a jury. It certainly gives you an insight that if there's no object in it and you were to enter the vehicle at a given time, you know how warm the air is when you enter that vehicle and are placed in it. Now, once you're in there, you're affecting that atmosphere and things could change. But the bottom line is if I went into that vehicle at 2.30 in the afternoon, for example, um, and I get inside the vehicle at that instant, it's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Once I'm in the vehicle, I'm now part of the heat transfer mechanism, and I personally now am affecting what's going on. But it's at 120 at that point. Regarding testing about air temperature in the vehicle, right? not what the temperature of a human being would be experiencing at different hourly benchmarks throughout the day. <coughs> well, again, I think as I just discussed, the temperatures that you see there, one way to look at it is if someone were to enter the vehicle at any instance, that's what the air temperature would be. As far as the influence of a person in the vehicle like a child over how the wrap would go, depending on whether it's generating heat or not, it would make a difference. But again, from my background and training, I don't think it would make a meaningful difference in temperature as far as the air temperature of the vehicle goes. You're focusing on the air temperature in the vehicle without a human being inside of it, correct? That was the focus of this testing, You're but my answer just now is saying that had there been a child in the vehicle, if we had done that, for example, that the air temperature monitoring data would not change significantly. Now, certainly in the near vicinity of the car seat, it would because there's a person there now. But if you got just away from the car seat, I don't think you'd find any meaningful temperature difference. But there's a meaningful temperature difference around the car seat with a human being inside of it throughout different benchmarks of the day, but this testing doesn't account for that. It doesn't account for the influence of a body generating heat, but again, it's my opinion it wouldn't matter. If you did this test with the body or without, I don't believe you'd see a substantial difference in these temperature curves as far as what the air temperature was at the same height of the car seat. And the car seat would be different though. That's a meaningful difference, as you said. No, because again, I would expect the difference. Let's, for example, let's conservatively say the difference is plus or minus four degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the instance. Uh, so if that's meaningful as far as other people using this data, I can't answer that either way. That's not part of my testimony. Uh, but no, I wouldn't expect it to have a big difference on the, the temperature result. And at the conclusion of this data, and compiling this data and this testing, you didn't verify and compare it to what people have actually done in studying children that died in hot cars. You didn't compare your work to any of those experiments. I'm not sure what you mean. I, are you talking about where they did experience, experiments where they did testing with a human subject in the car? <clears throat> I'm talking about researchers and scientists that accounted for heat index, humidity, actually got inside of a vehicle with a a thermometer, a real basic thermometer, and took photographs and videotaped themselves sweating and looking at the thermometer as it gets above 100 and whatever degrees within minutes. You didn't compare your data to that because it's remarkably different. 
Well, again, I, first of all, I totally disagree. It's remarkably different. The data would be the same regardless of the person in it. Uh, as far as doing that studies, very important factor in my world is I've got to be careful when I'm working with clients that I'm doing work that's within the scope of my abilities. And I'm a mechanical engineer. I work in the world of heat transfer with inanimate objects. As far as heat index and the way the body performs, there's certainly studies out there that are done and there's expertise in that area that I don't have. So all I'm presenting in my work is what the air temperature would have been on the date of my testing. I'm also presenting that discussions of humidity and a body in the vehicle, I don't foresee that as making any real difference in the data. As far as how that relates to how a child would respond or a person would respond to that environment, that's mm -hmm. outside the scope of my work, that's outside of the scope of my expertise, and that's simply why I didn't look into those issues. It would be inappropriate for me to do that and try to present that as information to, to those that have to make these decisions. I don't want to mislead you. Thank you. I need a couple of minutes, Judge, to show a flash drive so we can authenticate it. Would it be possible to take our morning break so I don't uh, waste the jury's time in doing that? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a morning break. Close your duck pads, open mind, close mouth, have a nice break. We'll only break for about 15 minutes.
Please be seated. All right, thank you, Judge. During our break, you had an opportunity to look at State Exhibit 387, which, for our record, is a package containing a thumb drive, correct? Yes. And since the defense made an issue of it, having looked at this thumb drive, which is included in 387, uh, does this contain all of the photographs and all of the videos and all of the raw data that you took as part of your testing? It does. Okay. And you confirmed that those photos are fair and accurate. In fact, some of them actually you're depicted in them, correct? Yes. And the video, similarly, those are fair and accurate video recordings of the entire testing process that you gave uh, um, um, testimony about? It is. I tender states 387, a copy which was previously furnished to the defense as part of reciprocal discovery. No objection. Admitted. There are over 300 photos on this. We're not going to go through 300 photos, so that, that's the good news. But just to show, I'll lay an example of some of them. Let's put the drive in. ATA, ATS testing, and I want to start with the site testing itself. There's a folder in there called Photos, and let's go to, for example, one thirty-four. All right, look, looking at States Exhibit One Thirty-Four, can you see that where you're seated? Yes, I can. Okay, you, you were not the only person out here <coughs> testing uh, during this testing process. In, in addition to yourself, we'll zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, Martin Jackson with the medical examiner's office. The jury might recognize him from yesterday. You recognize uh, Martin Jackson here on the end. And then this is Bob Tressel, chief investigator for the district attorney's office. Is that correct? I recognize Bob, yes. We'll go to. 153 is another example of these folks participating in the testing process and observing from the medical examiner's office and the district attorney's office, as well as the police department. Is that correct? Yes, the one in the blue shirt was one of an ATS employee. And then 161, and Martin Jackson, and Detective Phil Stoddard, who's seated here on the front row, uh, just outside the table. It is. Okay. He was there as well. And then you ask questions about a car seat. And I want to show you something. Go in photo 41 in the placement photos. All right, looking at 41, this is the car seat that was actually used for the testing. Is that correct? That's correct. yellow portion of the car seat just states exhibit 307 we looked at this during the break you see how part of this is kind of scratched off on this yellow sticker on the right side of that car seat yes and similarly the portion that's kind of scratched off on this white portion of that car seat as well looking at your photograph 40 and comparing that side does that appear to be the same car seat that you used for the testing? Well, again, as best I can do is just compare photographs, which the jury can do. But sure. It appears to be the same. <coughs> That's the car seat? This is photo number 38? Yes. Okay. I have a few other questions for you. You were asked a question about uh, the vehicle being, I don't know, vacuum sealed or airtight. You don't have any reason to believe that the vehicle that you tested the Tucson was uh, entirely airtight, correct? That's correct. Uh, would you expect the results of your testing to be different, though, if the vehicle was tested with the doors open or the windows open? It would depend on what's open, but obviously the more, if you had many doors open, uh, it would make a difference as far as air could actually penetrate or leave the vehicle and provide a mechanism for heat to get in or out as well. Because the vehicle was 
closed up um, during almost the entirety of your testing, these, these values were higher than you might expect if the vehicle were open during the day, correct? Compared to something that was wide open, certainly. Sure. And I'll talk about that for a minute. To completely replicate the scenario that um, we're investigating in this case, were you asked at some point to actually briefly access the vehicle at one point during the day? Yes, I was. And about what time did you actually access the, the vehicle uh, to replicate the exact scenario from June the 18th of 2014? About 1245 in the afternoon. All right. Is that the only time that you access the vehicle, other than the placement of the thermocouples and removing the testing um, after, after the day of testing? That's the only time. You were asked about the impact of a human being uh, potentially being in the vehicle. Um, might it matter whether that human being was a 22-month-old versus a grown adult man? In the sense, from a heat transfer standpoint, uh, Part of a body's ability to interact from a heat heating standpoint is their capacity to contain heat. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to object. I'm sorry. He had pre previously testified that this was outside of the scope and outside of his area of expertise, and so I would object to, to that question. Uh, I disagree. He's obviously got an answer to that based on his experience as an expert in heat transfer. So um, I think it's fair game for cross-examination if Mr. Rodriguez wants to do that, but it's a fair question for this witness if he can answer the question. If he can't, I trust he'll tell me that. But, um, overrule the objection. Can you answer that question? Yes, in the sense that not so much whether it's a human body or not, but whatever the object is, the more mass to the object, the more it may, that's one of the factors in how it would interact from a heat transfer standpoint. So from that basis, a small person versus a bigger person. Mm -hmm. The bigger person would have more mass and it would be more heat generation and more interaction with the cabin air, essentially. Um, under what circumstances um, would, would a human being being in that vehicle stop having an impact on the temperature inside the vehicle? At what point? Uh, I would say not so much when it would stop. Well. So, oh. I'm going to object as well. That is outside of the scope and expertise. He, he was not asked, and he testified repeatedly on cross, that he was not asked to determine the effect of a human body on the air cabin temperature during his testing on July the 8th, 2014. I will the objection. Again, in the sense of not so much a person, but just as an object at a temperature that if any object is at a temperature that's lower than the air temperature, it would be giving off heat to the air. If that object achieves a temperature that's the same as the air temperature, then it's neutral, there's no heat transfer. And if that object or body is at a temperature less, uh, so for example, uh, if that body were at, say, to pick a temperature 100 degrees Fahrenheit, once the air cabin temperature is above 100, that body is taking heat from the air. Prior to that time, the, the body would be contributing heat to the air. So. At some point, heat's either going from the body or to it, and that would depend on the body's temperature relative to the air temperature around it. But with a human being, say, at 98 degrees, wherever that may be, uh, once the temperature exceeds 98 degrees, that person would no longer be a, a contributor to, to the, the rise in temperature. Would that person any longer be a contributor once the, once the temperature exceeds? Again, if the body itself, for example, is at 98 degrees Fahrenheit and the air around it, it's neutral. So it would just depend on that body's temperature. You were asked about the drift effect, and um, I want to talk about that too. You were also asked about the start time of, of the testing. If you had started the time uh, later, what impact, if any, might that have on the lunchtime temperature when you access the vehicle? If I had started it later with the same air conditioning settings, uh, then by lunchtime, its only impact would result in a lower temperature at lunch. It would actually be cooler at lunch. Yes. Okay. And if it had an impact. Similarly, yes. if we went with the drift, which you, is drift downward, is that correct? That's correct. If we went with the drift rather than your expert opinion about the temperature in the vehicle, 
would that be lower or higher than what you have displayed here in your graph? It would depend on where, but for example, at 1136 where we did the restart, uh, it would be on the order of six degrees lower than what's represented on the chart. So even with the drift values at lunchtime, the temperature would be less? Yes, it would be on the order of, at 1136, for example, when we did the restart, uh, the drift value would be on the order of 82 degrees Fahrenheit as opposed to what's on the graph at 88. There was a question posed to you about uh, how this graph might look different mm -hmm. if the air condition wasn't run at all in, in, in the morning. Um, in, in terms of the, the end results towards the end of the day, would you expect them to differ at all if you had not run the, the air conditioner or run it at a low <coughs> level? No, I would not. And why is that? Because again, the primary factors uh, generating the way the heat goes and the way the temperatures respond are going to be the sunlight and the outdoor air temperature. Uh, and in particular, with the sun on the vehicle, it's such a big impact that it would uh, overwhelm any initial cooling as you went further in the day. Um, part of the reason that you documented 387 photographically and by video. Is that so somebody could go back and replicate this process if they wanted to? Yes, in terms of any type of testing I do, uh, a key ingredient for me is to make sure that all the variables that are pertinent are registered as far as what we did and the methodology. Uh, <coughs> from a scientific standpoint, the thought is that someone else could reproduce the testing and, and if things are done correctly, would expect the same results. So to that end, doing things like video and photography was trying to make sure I was as transparent as possible about the methodology and the conditions of that day. Has any other expert from either side contacted you asking you uh, to, to, to provide this other than us to give it in, in discovery? Not that I'm aware of other than just whatever data I provided to your office, my understanding is at one point it was provided to the defense. Now, I want to ask you some questions about um, the sunlight and the conditions on June the 18th of 2014. You, you weren't present on that day at Home Depot, correct? Certainly not. All right. Now, if there were video surveillance, such as that contained on 317, which has previously been shown to the jury, that certainly would demonstrate what the lighting conditions were on the day of June the 18th of 2014, were not. Again, I've not seen the video, but if, it, if the video can allow someone to detect when they see shadows, which would indicate clouds versus direct sunlight, that information would be helpful to consider. All right. And I know that you've testified that you're not a forensic pathologist or medical doctor, so the, the impact of heat on, it, on a, a human being, that's not what you're here to testify about, is that correct? That's correct, and that's why these earlier questions I'm couching in terms of a, just an inanimate body at a temperature uh, when I was discussing wet mass and things like that just a moment ago. But, for example, a forensic pathologist could certainly describe what impact it might have on a human. I'm going to object, cause for speculation. I'll move on to a different area. Yes. Um, based on everything that you have talked about here and looking at the graph displayed for the jury, also on 385, is it your expert opinion that this is an accurate gauge of the temperature inside that vehicle for the summer of 2014? It is, with the data of my testing, yes. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. You said that the videos of June the 18th if they show sunlight and shadows, that would be, in your words, important to consider? Well, again, I think it would be important to consider the videos. Not having seen them, I don't know what they depict. But if there's information that we could be gained with the video with regard to what the sun was doing and what the cloud coverage was, it would certainly be of interest, I would think, to look into. Okay. And, and you weren't asked to look into it. To be fair, you weren't asked to look into those videos. No, I was not. Um, <clears throat> the car seat. Um, obviously, you were under the impression that this was, or that the car seat that was inside the vehicle when you did testing on July the 8th was 
a different car seat than the original. Yes, that was my testimony earlier. Uh, this was done about two years ago, and that was my recollection then. <coughs> I do know that ATS actually bought an exemplar that we used in our shop to do some pre-work and setting up. And based on the photographic evidence that this is the actual car seat, then I may have mixed those two things in my mind. Okay. Um, you'd agree that at, at ATS, Applied Technical Services, you have ready access to leading experts in various scientific fields that are relevant to the forensic work with which you are involved. Yes, in fact, that's a statement I believe that was in my report to, to the uh, top county government. Okay. Um, yet, your research into how hot it gets in vehicles causes children to tragically die can be summarized by a two-hour Google search and as best as you, you can recall one publication from Australia? Yes, but again, if the scope of my work had been to answer that type of a question, like a pathologist type question, that level of work may be different for a person answering that question. All my research was simply done was to, based on the test methodology I had in mind, was to see what others had done, to see if uh, the techniques I was employing or what others had done, and that was the case. And that, that and looking at some of their results to compare my post results to, those were the two items of interest in my research. And certainly whatever that amount was, be it two or three hours, was sufficient for what that task was. As far as doing anything beyond that with how a child interacts <laughs> in a hot car, that was not part of the scope of work I needed to pay attention to for the work I'm presenting here. So no, I didn't do that type of research. That, that, that's not what you were paid $24,000 to do, correct? The research of the pathologist. What I was being paid for, our company was being reimbursed for, was to uh, determine what the internal temperature was on July 8th, 2014, to, in order to provide that data uh, for Cobb County to see fit to use in this trial. And that was the scope of my work. Thanks, sir. Happy birthday. You may step down. Can you just Thanks, make sure, um, before you leave, you make sure you don't have any of our exhibits with you. Thank you, sir. They would call Lauren Jamar. Please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury by telling them your name and then spelling it so the court reporter gets it right. Lauren Jamar, L-A-U-R-E-N-J-A-M-A-R. And Ms. Jamar, where do you live? I live in Los Angeles, California. Okay. How long you lived there? All of my life. All right. It's really not relevant to why you're here, but I just thought I'd ask you. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you do in California? I work for Whisper as the director of content operations. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? What's uh, what's your job duties generally? So I come up with the guidelines and standards for our user-generated content uh, from a community safety and a moderation perspective. And what is Whisper? So you, you said Whisper. What is that? Whisper is a media company. We also have an application. Okay. So uh, when you say a media company and an application, how is one different from the other? Um, so Whisper, the app, um, users can interact with one another via the app, whereas the website it's just reading user-generated content. Okay. 
as part of your job uh, at Whisper, are you basically the custodian of records? If you get a request from law enforcement or somebody like that uh, for certain records, are you the person who will get the records together, find out, okay, these are the accurate records, uh, and introduce them to law enforcement? That's correct. I'm going to show you what I work. Uh, Mark, for identification purposes, is State's Exhibit 388, which contains an envelope with Showing you states exhibit 388. Just ask you to take a look at that. And do you look at the second page? Do you recognize this? Yes. Okay, how do you recognize? And is that a certification that all of the uh, the discs that were provided to you were actually authentic records kept in the ordinary course of business by Whisper? Correct. Okay. Your Honor, I tender states 388 uh, at this time. Any objection? I'm sorry, Chuck. 388 is 388 is the business cert and the envelope, and then I'm going to pull out and introduce the other CDs. Okay. Um, I'm going to object just on the basis that we previously argued particularly for 404, 403, character of severance, uh, those that we have dealt with previously. I'd like to just maintain my objection for that. All right. We'll allow them up to that objection. And now uh, I'm just going to ask you to look at 389 through 393, ask you if you recognize those. <coughs> records actually um, five different discs involving records that were obtained or requested by Cobb County Police Department from your business. That's correct. And those fair and accurate records uh, from the business that you maintain in the ordinary course of business. That's correct. Okay, Your Honor, I attend your state's exhibit 389 through 393. Same objection. Same objections, please. Same rule. Now I'm just going to have you read out the certain, the, these numbers right here. These probably mean absolutely nothing to you, but just for the record to correlates later with the state's exhibit. Okay. Looking at State's Exhibit 389, it says Whisper Response. Uh, 
15SW0216. And each one of these discs, is this relevant to some different user or uh, an old business certification? Correct. Okay. Looking at states 390, it says whisper, and then what is that? 15SW0258. <coughs> States Exhibit 391. Let me get it upside down. 15 SW 0259. 392. 15 SW 0260. And finally, um, <coughs> excuse me, 393. What's that say? Cert. Okay. Did, was there originally these records? Were these originally provided by Whisper uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago? Correct. Okay, and were those provided by a different employee that you used to work with who no longer works there? That's correct. And what's her name? Nona Farinick. Now, you just talked about um, those discs, a little bit about Whisper. Um, as far as the application, um, how does the application work generally? So users can post thoughts or anything um, that's on their mind, essentially. Mm -hmm. They post it on the app, and it's overlaid with a, an image. So based on their text, we serve an image, and it's posted to the community, Whisper community. Okay, so basically you, you, there's a picture, and then writing over it. Somebody wants to make a comment, it's writing in front of a picture, basically. Correct. Right. Okay, and do you get to pick the picture, the person posting it, or does Whisper automatically uh, give a photograph? Um, we suggest, we'll give a series of suggested okay. images, and users can also choose their own photos. Okay. And we say the, the Whisper community, um, do you, how, is this a public forum, or do you actually have to sign up for it, or tell, <clears throat> tell the jury a little bit about that? It's public. We don't collect any personal data from our users, meaning they don't have to sign up using their name or email address mm -hmm. or phone number or any of that. Uh, when they join the service, meaning when they download the app, they're assigned a non-unique username that they can change or keep should they choose. So basically, uh, I guess it is, is it the attempt to allow the user to remain as anonymous as possible? Sure, we do provide that platform for anonymity. Okay. And when these posts, uh, somebody posts something on Whisper, uh, are other people or Whisper users uh, able to respond to that? Yes. Okay. Are they allowed to or able to respond publicly? Yes, the reply is public. Okay. And what type of replies can you do? You can heart, which is equivalent to a Facebook like. Mm -hmm. um, you can reply by creating another whisper in reply to that whisper, or you can start a private chat. But generally, these usernames from time to time can be something different every time. That's correct. Okay. Now, do you also have a platform? I don't know if platform is the right term, but it sounded good at the time. Um, do you have a way that you can actually message another person privately on Whisper? Say they post something, and then you send them a private message. Can you do that? You can. Okay, and how does that work? Is it like Facebook Messenger or something? Does it kind of go on to a different, like, conversation or? Right, that's private. We, we don't, we can't monitor or see any private chats, but they can start private chats from a whisper post. Okay. Now, do you guys maintain any records of private chats between uh, users? Not at all. Okay, so there would be no way for law enforcement themselves, just from whisper, to get conversations on private messaging. That's correct. Okay. Can they get records of public posts as to who has posted something? That, correct. Okay. Now, is, is it as easy as just saying, hey, I want to, if, if, you know, John Smith has a Whisper account, we want all his stuff. Is it that easy? No, because okay. we don't collect any personal data from a person named John Smith. It's okay. a non-unique username. Uh, how does law enforcement go about generally uh, trying to identify a set of records or a user to obtain records uh, for them? Uh, they have to provide a public post, uh, the text of a public post, or they can also provide the username. And when they do that, what type of information <coughs> do you guys, uh, you guys, Whisper, uh, maintain and what are you able to provide about that user? Uh, any identifying information? If that user had their location services enabled on their device at the time of posting a Whisper, we are able to see their IP and or their geolat long at the time of the Whisper post. Okay. So IP address, is it, well I said IP, is that their IP address? Correct. Basically, is that something that can track where their computer's located? I don't know how IPs work. Okay. But, um, well, I, I'll withdraw the question then. I don't, I don't want to get into speculating about that. Um, and the geo lat, what, what did you call it? Geo lat and long. Okay, and what is that? Latitude and longitude okay. at the time that the post was created. Okay. So it does, uh, it does reflect that you guys have at least the, the location, if they had their location services on, of where the post was done, some general area. Some general area, correct. Okay, thank you. I think that's all I have, Judge.
Good morning. You've come a long way, man. <laughs> Should have been here about a week and a half ago. It was a, a party. It was a hurricane. I know. <laughs> <It was different. laughs> and I don't mean the beverage hurricane. <laughs> um, just a couple things. Is it J A M A R? Correct. And I, I, I couldn't catch if it was Laura or Lauren. Lauren. L A U R E N? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Whisper. Um, how do you get signed up for it? If I want to be, um, if I want to have that app, how do I get signed up for your product? If you want the app, you go to your app store and download the app. Okay. That's all. And is it free of charge? It is. Right. How, how do y'all make your money if the app is free of charge? Um, I do not know. That's over your pay grade. Right? It is definitely over my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> well, let's say I was going to go on my phone and download uh, the app today. Um, is there is there any sort of age restriction for me being able to to, to download it however old, old I might be? No. Okay. So I can download it if I'm 12, I can download it if I'm 102. If you have access to an app store, you can download the app, although in the app store we are 17 plus. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That's how this first classified itself. All right, so if I go into the app store, it would, there would be, um, and I went to Whisper, there would be some sort of um, statement or warning that this app is for users 17 years of age or older? That's correct. Okay. Have you got any way to uh, monitor or ensure that users aren't under 17? Why 17? I don't know. Again, I, that's somebody else makes that decision. That's, that's that policy decision. That's correct. Okay. It has nothing to do with the law in California, as far as you know, versus the law in Georgia. That's my understanding, but I do not know. All right. And tell us a little bit about your um, your your customer base. How many users, uh, let's just say nationwide in the U.S., how many users uh, would you typically have of that app at any given time? That's hard to say. I don't know. Okay. Um, w would it be in the millions? Of users? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and do, do, is the app available in Canada and Mexico and, and the rest of the Americas? That is correct. All right. What about in Europe? Uh, yes. Okay. Is, is it pretty, pretty much worldwide? Yes. There are some countries we're not in, I would assume, but yes. Okay. And is there any is there any part of the U.S. where the, where you have more users, where the company is, is where the app is more popular? Not to my knowledge. Okay, um, you don't do um, data tracking and, and that sort of stuff. I do not. No. You do not. All right. If we were to ask any specifics about um, usernames and um, that kind of information. You, you don't really deal in the sort of the more technical aspects of, of, of how the application works, do you? I do not. Do not, okay. Is, um, what is your title? Director of Content Operations. Content Operations, All right. Do you spend a lot of time doing what it is you're, you're doing today, going to different locations to, to, to identify uh, documents for, for court and whatnot? No, I do not. Okay. How often have you had to do something like this? This is my first time. First time, okay. Well, what do you normally do as director of content information? Operations. Operations. I monitor the content, user-generated content, come up with the guidelines um, for user-generated content from a community safety perspective, okay. as well as from a moderation perspective. Um, and how long have you been in that capacity? A little over two years. Have you implemented some new um, safety protocols uh, and guidelines for um, the, the kind of information that, that Whisper now deems uh, appropriate uh, and safe? I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question or repeat the question? Mm -hmm. Since you've been in the job, have y'all implement, implemented any new guidelines um, regarding uh, content safety? What might be safe or appropriate for, for Whisper content? No, not since I've been in this role. Okay.
and um, if, if this is outside of what you do, tell me, but my understanding is that if I want to uh, post an image, if I want to post a, a thought, a post, I can type out the text and then the, um, the app can assign perhaps a, a, a random image to go with that, that text that I'm typing or that I want to post? Correct, that is an option. Okay. Or there's an option that I could actually um, mm -hmm. choose the image that's going to go with my text, right? That is correct. Okay. Are those the only two ways that, that, that the image and the text can be uh, matched together before posting? No. So the user also can upload an image from their device okay. and not use one of the hundreds of images that we may have suggested. Okay. It is, is, that, <clears throat> is that option or um, the availability of, of uploading <clears throat> images, has that always been part of the platform? Correct. Okay. So if I wanted to, to say something about my, my chihuahuas, I could actually upload a picture of them and, and then type in the, the the text over the image, right? That is correct. Do you have the ability to limit the, the area or areas in which the um, your posts are, are, are broadcast? No. Okay. Do, do you know if the app has some sort of algorithm that does that itself? I do not know. Just for example, if I were to post something here from St. Simons or Brunswick, would it show up in Corona, California? Yes. It would. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is, as far as you know, you think you've probably got more than a million users in the continental U.S. Correct. Of the app. Has that been a, has that been a fairly consistent number? For, for the last couple of years since you've been in this position? Yes. Okay. Enjoy Georgia. Just a couple follow-up. Uh, when you were talking about the whole, it, you, you guys say, you know, you're required to be 17 to use the app. Basically, can somebody just go on and say, yeah, I'm really 18 and click? Oh, or 17, I mean? Yes. Okay. So there's really no way to monitor that. Um, I know you, you haven't testified before. Have, uh, as a part of your job, do you, on a pretty consistent basis, have to, or sometimes have to provide records to law enforcement as a part of their investigation? Yes. Okay. Because I guess sometimes you, you may have users who are maybe underage, correct? Sure. And then you may have people out there wanting to do ill to a, a minor, correct? Sure. Thank you. You don't have a truth requirement either. I'm sorry? You don't have a truth requirement to, to post something, do you? I'm not sure I understand the well, question. Whatever I type and post doesn't really have to be true, does it? I mean, I could post that I'm six feet tall and that wouldn't be true. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> Can I? No, never mind. No further questions. <laughs> short witness? We don't. In fact, I was going to ask to approach about that. Um, our next chronologically shorter witness will be arriving during the lunch hour. Agreed? Yes. Well, we'll take a break then. Let's recess till one o'clock for the jurors to have their lunch. Everyone, take your notepads, close them up. You know the, you know the, the drill. Open mind, close mouth, do each other's go. Yeah. Oh, no.